Hello, and welcome to this GasTech ExxonMobil webinar supported by Energy Connects. My name is Denise Mannix, and I'm President and Board Director of Lean In Network Energy. Now, more than 800 people from all over the world have registered for today's webinar, so many thanks to all of you for your support. Shortly, I'll introduce our panellists, but before I do, a quick reminder that GasTech, the world's largest integrated exhibition and conference supporting the natural gas, LNG, hydrogen, and low carbon solutions industry, will take place at the state-of-the-art Fiera Milano venue in Milan from the 5th to the 8th of September, 2022. I'm delighted to say as well that Lean In Energy will be among the many official partners of GasTech in 2022. For more information about the conference and exhibition, please visit www.gastechevent.com. Again, that's www.gastechevent.com. Now, today's webinar is hosted in partnership with ExxonMobil. And uh, ExxonMobil, importantly, developed the LNG Power Play Initiative to help women in the industry to network, which we all know is critically important, and to do business. ExxonMobil will announce the winners of the fourth annual Power Play Awards at GasTech 2022. There will be three award categories this year for Power Play. The Pioneer, which recognises innovation and technology. The Ambassador, which recognises outstanding leadership. And the Rising Star, recognising an up and comer in the industry. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel of experts for this discussion. Please excuse if I pronounce your name uh, uh, incorrectly. You can blame it on my Australian accent. At least I can get away with it that way. First, we have uh, Alan Heng, Chief Executive Officer of Pavilion Energy. Hello, Alan. And uh, next, we have Iman Hill, Executive Director of the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Hello, Iman. It's nice to see you again. Lovely to see you too, Denise. Thank you. Um, our third panellist uh, it's, is uh, Cezanne Cole, and at the moment we're just having a, a few technical difficulties and we'll bring uh, Cezanne on as soon as uh, those have been sorted through. And finally, we have Professor Le Yang, Deputy President of the Institute of Energy at Peking University. Hello, Professor Yang. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. And to our audience, you are encouraged to submit your questions for our expert panel using the Q&A function. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can throughout the session, rather than waiting to the very end. I will pose questions to each panelist, and there is a lead responding to each question, and I will call on the remaining panelists to add value to each question. So just be aware that we'll have an, a nice routine that we'll be able to, to follow so that you'll hear from all the panelists. We now have just an, uh, under an hour remaining. So before we move on to our first question, uh, perhaps I can briefly set the scene of the topic for you. The DEI agenda has taken on new relevance in the post pandemic period for the energy sector. Companies are confronting unprecedented challenges if not real structural changes to their traditional organisational log logic, that is how they organise their work and their people. So each issue such as hybrid work and remote work, return to work, we all are experiencing um, stresses in trying to, um, you know, make sure that people are returning to work, when they're returning to work, and many don't want to return to work. We're also addressing and redressing the disproportionate uh, impact on women of, uh, of the pandemic era. We're also identifying um, uh, and trying to identify and then secure diverse talent for the energy transition. As well as we're looking at succession planning for a workforce that people can't see or rarely see because they, they don't always come into the office. And it, we're engaging with a depleted and diverse workforce concerned with compensation and opportunity inequity. Just from that sample, we know that the DEI question is certainly a very relevant one in this post-pandemic era. And these are forcing companies to look beyond 
policy and programs to the reality of transparent practice, sustainability and the true status of DEI in the post-pandemic world of energy. So having given you a little bit of a, a, a preparation for or the, the type of questions that we're going to be fielding uh, with the information that we have, our panellists will take on a series of these questions relevant to these issues and more. And so I'm going to turn now to um, uh, our first panellist, uh, Iman, and just a reminder to our audience to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. That would be greatly appreciated. So Iman, what are some of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated and or disrupted progress on the diversity, equity and inclusion agenda in the energy sector? Would you like to start with that, please? Thank you, Denise. But let me start by just saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's with us and a thank you to ExxonMobil and Energy Connects for the invitation to be with my co-panelists on this important top topic. So addressing the question, I'll start with a very uncontroversial statement, which I think everybody would agree with, which is that we're happiest and perform best when we can be ourselves because we all want to be valued for who we are. So an inclusive culture is one that embraces and celebrates our differences, which can be differences in experience, backgrounds, ways of thinking. And I think we all know as well that there's a lot of research that indicates that inclusive businesses have more highly engaged and motivated and productive workforces. The converse of that is that lack of employee engagement costs a whopping $7.8 trillion or 11% of GDP, according to a 2022 Gallup uh, um, a report that's looking at the global workforce. So diverse talent is one of the most important determinants of our industry's future. And there's always more that we can do. And let me get to, to, to some of that. Uh, we all know, I think, that a big challenge that our industry is facing is it's no longer attractive to some of the current workforce, but let alone the workforce of tomorrow. And if you look at the Ernst & Young survey, which has told us that 62% of Generation Z consider a career in oil and gas unappealing and 39% ranked it very unappealing. And so <laughs> DE and I can no longer be just a tick box, a tick, uh, a box ticking exercise and companies really need to take substantial action. And here are some examples. So I know some of our member companies, for example, have implemented employee resource groups around different dimensions of diversity, for example, gender, sexual orientation, race and disability. And this, these ensure that this topic remains a crucial part of company culture. Another way, Denise, uh, that leaders are demonstrating that this is a priority is, being, uh, is by being vocal about DEI related issues. And I can mention some examples of our member companies such as BP, Chevron, Shell and Exxon were amongst many that made public statements following the death of George Floyd. But it's worth bearing in mind that company policy needs to actually follow these statements and paying lip service to these issues but not delivering meaningful change is often worse actually than providing no support at all. Um, other things that we can talk about. Other hello. Things... Hello. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Okay, can shall you... I continue with my answer? Yes, I'm not quite sure what's happening there. So please continue, Iman, and we'll try and work that out. Yeah, thank you, uh, Denise. So I think there are other things to mention. Top-down commitment is critical as part of company strategies, and we definitely need to have a clear framework for measurement. Because let me just remind everyone that although, for example, if I pick on gender in particular, although 48% of the global workforce um, is our women, uh, actually in our sector, and this hasn't moved very much, by the way, in the last few years, if you look at any of the um, reporting that's been done by uh, OEUK, for example, only 22% uh, 
um, of, uh, are represented in the energy se sector. So we've made progress, but much more needs to be done from companies and industry bodies to ensure that this remains, the DEI remains a priority concern. And then if I get really specific now, which is why we have set up the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers, which basically represents uh, almost 50% of global production, you know, global energy demand uh, met, be, being met by our members. We've set up a task force, which is Workforce Energy, which is going to unite, which is aims to unite the industry on this critical area and aims to essentially lay out the best practices of the last 30 years of effort to make sure that we can make some concerted and coordinated effort. Um, I can always add some more examples later, but I'll come back to you now, Denise, to, to maybe bring in some of our other panellists. Absolutely. So um, what I'd like to do before we go any further is to welcome uh, Cezanne, who's arrived, and that was the disembodied voice that you that you heard that cut into, the, into your... Uh, uh, you, what you were saying. So I'd like to wel welcome uh, Cezanne and perhaps ask her um, if she'd like to, uh, because this was uh, 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 a question that she had also looked at and prepared, um, is there something specific that you would like to add to that con to that to this conversation that we're having, Cezanne? Hey, uh, Denise, hey, good afternoon, good morning to everybody as well as good evening to the friends that darling from uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, PT that the system got like 40 minutes to start up and Iman, I, I apologize for interrupting you. Now, Denise, I presume the question that you are in right now is regarding, you know, what has been the potential win uh, outside of the pandemic. Is that correct? Yes, we can certainly uh, we can certainly uh, take that because that's a very important one. And then we also have a question from the audience. So um, let's let's start with: Are there any spe specific pandemic-related DEI wins? Would you like to take that on? Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. I mean, you know, the fact that you know all of us can gather together and then we have a huge audience that dial in. I think that shows really the resilience. So, in my perspective. You know, this pandemic, really the win is about showing the resiliency. And, uh, you know, one of the programs that ExxonMobil has is a signature event called Power Play that I believe many of you may have heard about. And that helped bring together men and women in the global LNG industry to network and to do business together. And last year, we added a Power Play award called Concurrer. And that's really to recognize women in the LNG space who have overcome adversity and demonstrated an incredible resiliency due to challenges faced by COVID and the ensuing pandemic. Among many, many nominations around the world, many inspiring stories were revealed. After a very tough selection process, we actually identified four outstanding female leaders to be finalists and eventually one winner among those four that show resiliency in the pandemic, in the face of pandemic. So, for example, this winner right, changed most people's work pattern, right, because most of us actually experience changing of work pattern from office base to home base. And this particular winner let the business continue a plan on top of base operation and work to increase, increase clarity, and reduce anxiety for home-based colleagues, which is so important during the pandemic. And then at the LNG site operation, she led the camp set out to house workers, testing facilities set up for health screening and new shift patterns and additional compensation programs to really help people who are impacted. So I feel that, you know, out of this pandemic, you know, people have become more resilient and that helps DEI as well, Denise. Fantastic. Thank you for, for that, uh, that excellent example. And I think that's, uh, it's, it's about showing and really demonstrating, as Iman was saying, um, a, 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 true, um, a true commitment to, to DEI and it's got to go much further than, than we have uh, in the past. Um, I'd like to um, just ask before we move on to the next question. I'd certainly like to ask um, our other panelists um, if what do they what thoughts do they have about this question? 
So, um, uh, Alan, would you like to uh, make a comment on this? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think uh, the, the entire diversity and equity, uh, equity and inclusion agenda needs to be foremost on our mind. Uh, the COVID-19 was, 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 was an event that happened, and in many ways it disrupted the lives of many and brought into sharp focus and contrast some of the challenges that our workforce faced in the past but never, ever highlighted it to us. You know? uh, as an example, uh, we, we know that uh, through working from home, you realize that not everybody lives in the same comfortable environment that many of us may do. You find that there are some who have had to share uh, rooms with elderly parents, uh, kids that are running around. You find some where the space that they have is a lot smaller than others. Uh, you find people who may prefer to have lived in some other parts of the world because they are separated from their family. Now, all these issues brought to light the necessity for us to actually think a little bit more about each individual's uh, requirements for their general wellness. And, and I think uh, we, many organizations have adapted well. Uh, at, at Pavilion Energy, we, we, we embraced that very early on and tried to make the whole work from home thing as seamless as possible. Uh, and, and try and learn as much as we can, uh, including trying to find ways where we created hybrid events so that people can connect. And one of the things we found was that uh, through this whole process, the importance of connection, the importance of connection, not just from the company to an individual working for the company, but individuals themselves. And, and you can only do that if everybody embraces diversity and has a sense of unity for the company. So I'll leave it at that for a minute. Thank you. And, um, and also for Professor uh, Yang, do you have any comment in relation to this topic? OK, thank you. I think it's a very good topic. In fact, uh, we are in the age of a huge change. We had noticed two years ago, like our oil and gas industry, it looks uh, so low price, but now it never uh, image so it's uh, uh, the DEI is uh, very important uh, as the uh, Mrs. Gu uh, mentioned religions uh, you know uh, we make our the industry robust it's very important the DEI is very important uh, for this uh, we, we are uh, many challenging uh, ahead so I stop yes. here thank you no, absolutely, and, and I think that that's that's the struggle is to move beyond just um, focusing on policies and sort of uh, putting programs in place. It's really on the the, the execution that we're moving towards, um, the real commitment to um, how do we make this work and how do we make it work on an individual level when we've often thought about it in a much more global sort of context context. Um, I know that we're, uh, we're just a little bit over time on this question, but we've had a couple of questions from the audience. And if uh, someone uh, would like to, to address this, um, I, I, I certainly don't want to put anyone on the spot. But uh, there are two questions. One question is um, uh, from Henry, I believe, and that is, do quotas work? So I, I presume um, Henry's talking in relation to DEI. Um, you know, in terms of a quota for, um, you know, the DEI perspective. Um, and the second question um, is also, uh, can the panellists give any hints on how organisations measure progress on DEI initiatives? Uh, would anyone like to tackle that? I'm happy to, to tackle it. Thank uh, uh, Thanks, Aman. So I, I'll take the first part of it. Uh, so I'm... I'm providing a personal perspective here. Um, I think that there is a place for quotas when you are really trying to perhaps create parity. And, and you know, there is um, 
there, are, there is a report that's been published by um, uh, OEUK, which says that it's going to take us about 30 years to create gender parity, for example. So there may be a place for quotas when you're driving for parity. However, I think the, my, my personal opinion is that the dark side of quotas is that, you know, whichever minority group we, we're in, often we actually have to work harder, it feels, be smarter, uh, be more committed in a way to advance. And imagine getting to, you know, to the top of your game or a level of seniority and anybody could say to you, could say, you know, either directly to you or behind your back, well, she or he only got there because of quotas. So if you were to ask me as Iman, uh, do I favour quotas? My answer to that uh, is, is no. Uh, so that's um, that's where I stand on this, uh, Denise. And I've probably forgotten okay. a lot of part of the question, but perhaps <laughs> that's I'll ask you. okay. That's okay. We we might be able to, to fit it in as as we go. So my apologies to Lucy, but we'll definitely come back to that question um, just so that we can keep on track and keep on time. And in fact, now what we uh, we'll actually uh, we'll, we'll go back to you uh, for question two, Iman, if you don't mind. Um, and, and this one is uh, among the most enduring changes inspired by the COVID nineteen pandemic has been the growth of home and hybrid working. But there's a danger that these new working models could marginalise already disadvantaged segments of the workforce. So what can industry leaders do to safeguard against that? Thank you, Denise. So I think, you know, as with anything new in the working world, there's always the possibility that it could further disadvantage already marginalised working people. But of course, the reality is that there are advantages and potential pitfalls that we need to be conscious of. Because, for example, there's been data that shows how re remote working arrangements can lead to what has been termed a Zoom ceiling. So this is a new term, I think, in the last couple of years. Basically, what it says is that either intentionally or unintentionally, remote employees face greater challenges c compared to in-person workers, you know, such as less opportunity for promotion. And there's been a, a study done by Stanford in 2015 that found that Although remote workers are more productive uh, compared to their in-office colleagues, they weren't given the same opportunities for promotion. In fact, possibly as, as much as half, uh, you know, 50% less uh, opportunities, and they were 38% less likely to receive a bonus compared to workers who never worked from home. You put that against the backdrop of the fact that 68% of women preferred to work remotely post-pandemic compared to 57% of men, which, you know, again, mm -hmm. you need to be conscious that it can lead to people being overlooked or being out of sight. But hybrid and remote working is the new normal and something that is valued amongst new and existing talent. Um, and, you know, find that flexible working arrangements were a tr top priority amongst 62% of Gen Z and 60% of millennials. And so the positive of this is that it can create remote working can create a more welcoming environment for employees, um, opening doors for groups that have previously struggled, for example, new parents, including single parents, because you can have a more uh, balanced work life uh, balance through more flexible schedules. It can enhance accessibility for disabled talent who may struggle or, you know, have more difficulty getting to interviews or commuting to the office. Mm -hmm. so how do we combat marginalisation? It needs to be remote working, needs to be now properly integrated into company strategy and culture. And a first point or starting point in that is basically to, in to ensure that managers and, and actually all leaders are coached on how to balance a hybrid remote workforce so that equal opportunities ex extend to all team members. And that part of that is making everyone in the organization conscious that we could be excluding people by essentially having them sort of out of sight, out of mind. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex um, scenario at the end of the day. And I mean, very often, I, I think, 
um, organisations have have yet to really figure out that it's not the problem of the individual who's at who's at home. This is our issue. And as I had a uh, I had a, um, a CHRO say to me uh, only a few weeks ago, um, we're really struggling to understand how do we even do our succession planning when we don't even see them in the office. We don't even see them often enough to see. Um, how they um, how they how they're functioning with their teams, etc. So it, it is a really complicated one. And I know I've, I'll call now on uh, Cezanne because I know she was interested in in making a comment here. Yes, and uh, you know, Denise, thank you, and uh, you know, uh, Iman, that's a really excellent answer. And and I feel that you know, organisational effectiveness benefits from coming together in person at our workplace to collaborate and build community. So, you know, I echo what you mentioned. And, you know, in ExxonMobil, I think one of the programs that I really always advocate and use is the Workplace Flexibility Program. And it's available to address unique, right, personal needs, as has always been the case, right? And and I, I will tell you, uh, share with you a personal story and example that I use this Workplace Flexibility and a lot of you that know me knew that my son actually had a terrible accident when I took on the assignment in China. And, you know, I had to fly back, you know, to the U.S. He was in the U.S. I had to fly back to U.S. to nurse him. But because of this workplace flexibility program, it really allowed me to still work in the U.S. while handling, you know, the matters in China. So even though there's, a, you know, a bit of a time frame differences and all this, but it worked, and I, I had that arrangement, you know, for a couple of months, you know, so it really helped to manage, you know, my son's situation while still taking care of my career. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we if we lost her then, but um, I think she was making some very relevant um, uh, anecdotal and personal perspectives on on on. Uh, on what we're talking about, um, uh, Alan, do you have anything you'd like to add to this uh, to this question? Uh, I, I I do echo uh, I think Iman's point around the fact that the problem is not with the person working from home; it's how the rest of the organisation uh, views work from home or hybrid work arrangements. Uh, often, uh, unless we adapt with practices and policy changes. As well as more important, a mindset change by uh, supervisors who are used to having people on site and having to talk to them on site, uh, it makes for a hard. It's clearly a lot easier if you are someone outgoing and someone who's prepared to pick up the phone and talk to people to work from home because that's your natural self. Uh, a lot harder for the introverts in us who may be very comfortable in our own space and uh, and and will not will not step out to, to, to engage with others. So when you're stuck at home, I think that's even worse. So th there is that balance we need to find, and, and the key for us is to find ways to keep engaging people. Uh, and, and, and we've found different ways to do it in, in Pavilion Energy. Uh, we, we, during the hybrid work session, we even had a lunch meeting where you know, we sent to grab, we, we sent food to their, their homes and actually organized a lunch and then had a lunch right. meeting. So it felt a little bit like as if they were from, from office. Uh, that, that was just a simple example. But the more we adapt, the more we make things normal for them uh, to work from home or to work in a hybrid way, I think the better it is the organization will be able to cope uh, with, this, uh, with these changes. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, that, that echoes um, the, uh, the some of the, the earlier points that were made even in, in, in question one um, that, that we responded to. Um, and I know Iman referenced uh, some of that in, in, in what she had to say. So um, I haven't forgotten you, Professor Yang. Uh, and uh, But what I would uh, like to say is we'll come back to you in a moment. But um, we might keep moving on. I'm conscious of, of the time, and we've got a very eager audience, and we've had another uh, question. So um, I'll, I will come back to that as well. But what I'd like to do now is uh, to pose this thing, as I've got you on screen, Alan, for question three. You couldn't get away from us that easily. Earlier this year, PwC spoke to more than 52,000 workers from 44 countries 
as part of their global uh, workforce hopes and fears survey. The fact that we actually have to have a survey about this is, is quite frightening, really. Um, the study found that one in five people plan to change jobs or leave work entirely in 2022. This phenomenon has often been referred to as the Great Resignation. In what ways could the Great Resignation help energy companies to adapt and optimise their DEI practices? Well, well, Would you like to? Uh, yeah. yeah, before I get onto the Great Resignation, uh, I think uh, it was mentioned earlier that the industry is not as attractive as it used to be. And right. uh, in fact, there's something called the great did not apply. Uh, we've seen a lot of people not even apply for jobs in what was used to be a really attractive energy industry. So we need to get over that hurdle of making the energy industry attractive. Uh, it, it is not just about um, bringing reliable energy to people in an affordable way, which is a really important function. It's about how we participate in the future energy transition and how do we make for a more sustainable development. I think those are the things that will attract younger people to join the organization and to stay in the career. Um, just back to this issue around uh, uh, the great resignation, I think it's something that is, there are two parts to it. First, I think we really recognize that our, uh, the people and the organization have gone through two years of uh, traumatic changes, uh, changes which has affected their lifestyle, changes which has affected their work patterns, uh, and, and it's not just them, but it's also their family. And if you like, they're going through this whole period of dramatic change. Now, I think the great resignation has a lot to do with that as well, because people are trying to cope and adjust to all these changes. And I think the best thing that a company can do is to try and help our people ride through this period and get back to a little bit more sense of normality going forward. Now, how do we do that? I think we do that by thinking carefully about our practices, our DIE practices. How do we adapt to each individual's needs? How can we customize things a little bit better within the construct of an organization? I mean, at the end of the day, let's, let's be frank, uh, the company exists because it has to create economic value. How can we continue to do that without compromising uh, and yet adapt to practices that might be more suited to it? Um, so the good thing about uh, at Pavilion, we, we've, had, we've had the opportunity to, to uh, through this whole pandemic and period and the recognition that it was great resignation, uh, had to adapt our workplace policy. So we have a, a flexible work arrangements where employees can work up to two days a week from where they are at home or anywhere around. Uh, if an employee has to be away for an extended period, uh, they can apply for a period where they can work in a different country uh, or a different location uh, for an extended period. I've had a staff who's now worked for almost a year in KL to be, because she wants to be with the husband uh, when her job was in Singapore. So that's an example where we've adapted and, and uh, uh, to, to, to the way we optimize our practices so that we can try and retain people. Uh, there's no one size fit all. I think it's really about listening to your employees and then working with them. Uh, at Pavilion, we are rather fortunate. We, we, we have a, we are a young company. We have a smallish workforce, about almost 200 people. So we could adapt uh, easily without causing too much grief for the organization. Um, but at the end of the day, it really comes back to this. How can we put our employee at the forefront, understand their needs, and try and adapt as much as possible? All right? Uh, and, and, and there's no one size fits all. The whole, I mean, the simple idea is how can we create a happier, healthier workforce? And then, you know, and through that, hopefully retain them better for the organization. One other point I would like to make is that the reality is that when I first joined the energy industry, uh, it was the norm for an individual to work their entire career in one company. Yes. Today, I think uh, we will be very happy if that individual worked their entire company in the industry, albeit with different companies. I think that's equally important because the, the reality is that uh, 
the, the social contract between a long an employee and an employer for long term contracts no longer exists. It's really about their skill sets. It's really about whether they can uh, be relevant in their organization at that point in time. So in some ways, we have to acknowledge that the reg the great resignation or the resignation of employees with shorter tenures might be something we have to learn to adjust. So uh, it's about how we adapt to that. So, so it's not going to go away, but help our employees get through this period of uh, difficulty, uh, make policies a little bit more flexible and adaptable, and uh, uh, recognize that this is this may become the norm, right? We're not going to end up with uh, with one single employee working 35 years in one company. They, we, we, can't, we can't expect that anymore. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what I might do is um, uh, ask um, uh, Professor Yang, would you like to comment on this at this point? Okay, and uh, I think you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, after the pandemic, uh, many people don't want to work. And uh, I think partly because they rethink about their life. They want a, a balanced life. And I know many people, they worked because they have to. But so we need to change the, uh, you know, our uh, paradigm. We, we, we should make right. the job more attractive, interesting, and uh, uh, we'll put the people in the center, not uh, only think about uh, make money or, or our economic performance. So uh, it's uh, uh, it's also a chance to let the managers to rethink uh, how to mobilize our people, and uh, you know it's a true value for the company. Uh, thank you. I stop here. Okay. No, that no, you make an excellent point, and I think one of the other things probably that we we also need to kind of remember is that with the speed at which all of this changed, we were forced uh, in organisations to change immediately. We didn't have time to develop anything. What we, I think one of the issues that we probably are looking at now is um, we're feeling a little bit more comfortable. We're starting to uh, think more like we were thinking before the pandemic about, you know, people coming into the office. And so we've got to be careful that we don't lose, I, th I think, in my opinion, the speed and the necessity that, uh, that was driven uh, by the pandemic uh, for benefits of all. So um, I, I just wanted to call on, uh, on two people. Um, I, I believe that we've got Cezanne uh, 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 back online, and you wanted to make a comment, Cezanne. Mm, yes, um, you know, Denise, thank you. And you could know, you, could I, you just I, speak up I, a little I, bit, please, Cezanne? Yes. Just can you can you hear me better now? That's a little bit yeah, better. Thank you. you. Yes. Thank yeah, you. All right. So I feel strongly that you know the energy industry as a whole. We need to share with the broader audience about what energy industry is about, the importance of the energy industry, and then what can we do for the individuals to actually groom them to their full potential while helping, you know, to provide reliable energy to the world as well as tackle the climate change. And diversity inclusion is very important to make our industry very attractive as a whole. So I think that's a very important point that I feel that all of us can play a role to push this agenda forward, to make people understand our energy industry much better than what it is today. Yeah, Denise, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks uh, for that, Cezanne. I'm glad to, uh, get, to get you back. Um, Iman, you wanted to make a comment? Yes, it was really just to say thank you, Denise, and I really um, totally agree with Cezanne and all the other um, uh, panellists, the views that have been expressed. But I just wanted to, to, to make a simple comment, which is that, you know, the pandemic caused all of us, I believe, at least the majority of us, to really think about what's important to us, how we want to work, the fact that, you know, we, we really would like the values of our, of our organizations to match with our own personal values. And we thought about that much more because we had things slowed down. But, you know, at its simplest, everybody would like to be represented. They want to be represented in their organization and they want to be valued for their individuality and the way that they 
bring themselves and show up at work. And so at its very simplest, it's really about being authentic, about valuing difference and showing that by aligned actions with your words and making your employees really understand that this is important because they will then be showing up to work happy, um, you know, and productive. And in the end, that makes, you know, great economic sense for shareholders. But I think authentic leadership is the key to this and being inquiring. And it comes back to the question, which I've remembered now, which I think Lucy asked at the beginning, which is, yes. How can you tell if you're making progress? And this is where measuring, and for me, I think measuring through conversations, through asking, through structured surveys, through regular engagement, through encouraging a culture where your employees actually feel safe, so psychological safety to be able to express themselves openly and transparently, even with difficult things that they might, might want to say. And also then celebrating the big wins or the small wins, celebrating the behavior that you want to see. All of those things may seem soft and intangible, but they're all really, really uh, important, I think, to drive our agenda, this DE&I agenda forward and to be visible in demonstrating that it's important. Yeah, and I think you you raise an interesting uh, and very valid point because even in the PwC survey, one of the things it does mention is that women feel um, terribly excluded um, by the, uh, the the process of of being at home, um, and so they have real concerns about um, you know their longevity in in a job or longevity in 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 uh, in a, in a, in, a, in a, in the sector even. So I think these are all things that it is very much about authenticity and really understanding what this agenda means, not what we think it means uh, in the post-pandemic uh, time. So thank you for that. I have to keep moving. and I'm terribly sorry because I know that, um, you know, I know people are asking uh, questions uh, uh, in the Q&A function, so keep doing that. Um, but we have to move on to... Um, the, the, the next question, which is to uh, Professor Yang. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's actually a, a, quite a short one. Environmental, social and governance, or ESG bonds, have enjoyed record returns over recent years, but now a growing number of analysts are predicting the end of the virtue bubble. So um, what, how, what would you respond to that with, uh, Professor Yang? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I would like uh, to say the ESG is related to the long-term value. People always pay more attention to the short-term issues. It is naturally that when the economic performance is not very good, people prefer sacrifice the long-term value first. Here you see the, the virtual bubble. Uh, but the virtual won't be a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> the principle of ESG, you know, investing, uh, not uh, not a new thing. In fact, hundreds of years ago, uh, religions and it's a, it's ethical beliefs influenced the invest uh, decision. Uh, as uh, issues such as climate change and COVID nineteen have demonstrate, demonstrated the fragility of business as usual approaches. Uh, they have also highlighted the importance of organizational religions, as uh, Zishan mentioned. Uh, shareholders and the stakeholders expect the uh, transition towards more environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable business activities for future. Maybe it's not deserved to be called a virtue. It is just to take care of the long-term value. Uh, for example, in fact, uh, uh, I, I mentioned here a U.S. financial service firm, Morningstar, found that over a period of 10 years, 80% uh, of the blend equity fund, uh, which invests in sustainably outperformed the traditional fund. Uh, I, I think. Uh, it's very important for the oil and gas and for the energy industry to pay more attention to the DEI. It's also 
very important in the energy transition. It uh, will be a key value of our industry. You will want to keep the, you know, our energy uh, companies uh, you know, in line with the new age of the uh, carbon neutrality uh, you know, time. So uh, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, we should work together to, to, uh, to make the more transparency, you know, for the industry and also to make more uh, clear standards. In fact, uh, when we talk, we should, we should follow some principle, but uh, we don't have very clearly in many aspects in the industry of industry itself and also some accounting and also the financial things. Uh, I think also in China, I know, uh, you know many uh, standards and also the policies are in the progress. And also we are happy as a single time to work with the people. And even, you know, we, we have some short-term challenges, but uh, right. uh, I do right. believe in the long term, the DEI, uh, it's uh, very important because, you know, it's a true value of ourselves. It's not only uh, for the business and uh, you yes. want to make money now and make money in the future, then we must. It's right. not like, uh, right. yes. Yes, I think no, I stop you... here. <laughs> No, absolutely. I think you've, you've made some really, really good points. And I think that issue of um, looking at what others are doing, the transparency, I think is very important. There was a futurist, uh, Charles Handy, back in the 90s, I think it was, who made, you know, who made um, a comment about how um, companies in the future are really going to want to uh, collaborate, uh, even if they are, um, uh, they, they are not, uh, you know, typically... Um, associated, so if they're competitors, etc. And I think that uh, we're starting to see some of that, um, some of that happen. But I think there's more to it, and I think part of that is is really looking at what other companies are doing from a DEI perspective that really makes sense, and as you say, makes sense for the long term as well. But we've got to also do some stuff right now. So you make some really valid points. Um, uh, so. Um, do we have? Uh, does Cezanne have anything that she'd like to uh, she'd like to comment on with this before we move on? No, no, no. Denise, oh, please okay. move on. I realize that time is running out here. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Okay, absolutely. No. Um, what um, What I'd like to um, to do now is um, just very quickly to get uh, everyone to provide a response. I'd ask you don't need to keep to some very short answers to the following question. Um, what is the single biggest obstacle or the, and or the most effective tools in building a truly diverse, equitable and inclusive global energy sector? So most effective tools and biggest obstacle. If you want to add, um, either add, um, answer both or, um, or just one aspect of that, but keep it really, really short. So uh, seeing as we have you uh, sitting on the screen with us here, uh, Professor Yang, would you like to answer that in a, in a couple of seconds? <laughs> okay, thank you. I uh, will keep it very <laughs> short. I think the, the, the biggest obstacle is ourselves, the man. You know, we must change our man first, then we can change the things. Otherwise, we, we try to... We try to do something, but in fact, uh, we we need to change first. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alan. Would you like to make mention? Uh, our mindset. Uh, the the whole energy industry has a great legacy, but it comes with inherent bias. And I think the quicker we overcome our internal mindset, the better. Uh, I'll leave you with one thought. Uh, Pavilion Energy is a very new company started in 2013. We have 47% of our workforce uh, female. And we have the amazing statistics that 25% uh, of our frontline LNG traders, which is probably the most stressful job you can find out there, 25% are male. So we have 75% of the traders female, right? Because mm -hmm. there's no inherent bias. There's 
absolutely no legacy we're dealing with and we've allowed our processes to take care of itself and we've got what we have today. Thank you. Excellent. Great comment. Um, and now Iman? So you, I'll, I'll be short. So I think the biggest barrier is unconscious bias and legacy, which uh, Professor just, just mentioned. So I think that's, that's the, the biggest barrier. As far as um, enablers or things that we can do, actually we have to be concrete about driving action. And then we really need to do, a, you know, we have to have a learning loop. So let's not wait till we've got the 100% solution. Let's go for tangible actions and then reflect and then look back and think, OK, what worked? You know, measure, test, adapt as you go. Those are just some brief things that I think can help in terms of driving, um, you know, uh, better, uh, better performance. Yeah, it's, it's about driving outcomes as opposed to just looking for opportunities. I think there's a huge difference in that and we've spent a lot of our time looking at opportunities rather than than outcomes um what i'd like to uh to also ask is uh Cezanne, if she'd like to make a comment there yes and uh you know denise i'll make a comment and give each and every one of us a challenge my comment is that the pandemic as well as the energy transition highlight the ever importance and need for technology breakthroughs and innovation. And study shows that companies that invest in inclusion and diversity, key innovation could be enhanced by more than 20% and eight times better chance of more favorable outcomes. So, you know, all companies need to embrace this journey. Then the challenge for each and every one of us on this call the challenge is, you know, when we jump out of bed every morning, we need to think about, you know, what positive difference can we make on this DEI journey, right? Can we coach somebody? Can we mentor somebody that is totally different from us so that we plant the master seed? And I believe that each and every one of us, if we plant the seed, the tree will grow and then our next generation, this generation and next generation can enjoy the shape from the forest that we built together. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, well, um, we do have time for a one, uh, one of the questions that wasn't answered, um, and it came in by, from uh, Omaima, I think it is, Omaima. Um, and her question was, or his question was, how does pay equality compare to other similarly sized um, sectors would it, uh, and that's so it's you know talking about uh, that uh, pay parity issue who would like to anyone like to comment on that uh, maybe Iman or Alan or so let, just let me um, clarify the question Denise uh, is the question um, about pay parity in our sector in the energy sector versus other sectors yes or yes it, it so is. How, how does pay equality or pay parity um, compare to other similarly sized sectors if we're looking at um, oil and gas or the broader energy sector? Yeah. So I can answer from my personal experience, and, and I, it's shocking, shocking to, to, to still say this today <laughs> that pay parity, disparity, pay disparity still exists in the energy industry and here we are in 2022 um, so i think that there are some structural things systemic things related to hiring to pay remuneration reward all of that that has to be part of because this is a systems process we need to look at this as a system uh, and tackle all those parts of it um, but it still exists in the energy industry no, uh, and, and you make uh, you make uh, some really important points. And having worked in uh, in the, uh, the oil and gas industry in in, in an HR uh, position, I know those discussions around uh, with senior managers about around pay parity is is uh, is, is an issue. So um, look, we're going to have to um, move on because it's uh, we we just got four minutes 
uh, to the hour and uh, I need to keep moving. So, um, I, you know, I know your time is, is really, really valuable. So um, I've, I've really very much uh, enjoyed the, the discussion. Uh, we've had some thought provoking questions. We've had some good questions also from um, uh, from the uh, from the audience. It would be lovely to, to have more, but we're just not able to do that, unfortunately. Um, and so Alan, Iman, Cezanne, and uh, Professor Yang, thank you so much for your contribution today. I really enjoyed meeting you and listening to your expert thoughts. And I know that there's a couple of you that I'll, I'm going to be seeing uh, at Gas Tech 2022. I think, Iman, we're going to be together again doing something. Um, yes. We're destined to do something together. Anyway, um, and that reminds uh, me to remind you that Gas Tech 2022 will take place this September in Milan. If you enjoyed our discussion today, you might be interested to know there'll be a dedicated diversity, equity and inclusion program running throughout the event. Uh, you can find more details on the feature program section of the Gas Tech website. Once again, www.gastechevent.com. Oh, I could be a TV announcer. I'm doing. I feel like I'm. I'm able to uh, to handle that one. Uh, so finally, please note that you will soon receive an email containing instructions on how you can access a recording of this webinar. So please do feel free to share this with your colleagues and peers, and encourage the uh, attendance at Gas Tech 2022. It's going to be quite superb from what I've uh, I've understood. I'd like to um, thank you all for attending. Once again, thanks to our, uh, uh, our fantastic uh, panelists for um, their wealth of knowledge and even the disparity of, um, of, their, of their thinking uh, really means that we're in a healthy place that we, that we can talk about these things. So once again, thank you for, for, for uh, being with us today. Thank you all for attending and I uh, hope to see uh, many of you in September in Milan. So thank you. Thank All right. You. Thank you, Denise. See you in Milan. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.